So I've been wanting to do this one for a long time. Uh, for, for ones like this, people sometimes are like, Argent, why haven't you done the Batman movies or, or something like that? Or The Matrix, even though it's pretty probably your favorite movie. It's because if I'm going to do something that's really important to me or something I, I have a lot of thoughts on or that I've seen multiple times, I really want to make sure I have good ideas or, or complicated or just kind of um, comprehensive ideas of what I want to say. And this is one of them. This was probably my favorite science fiction series uh, growing up. I'll probably also, hopefully this week, do a reaction review of Deep Space Nine. Um, and there's always kind of the thought that uh, Deep Space Nine copied Babylon 5. And I think it did in some ways, but I don't really think it did thematically. Um, they're about very different things. Uh, Deep Space Nine is about morality and political issues. Babylon 5 is more about metaphysics, in particular the issue of identity. Throughout the series, we um, we see characters struggling with a sense of self. Um, I, I can't really... It's hard to, to kind of describe it without going into the five questions, which we'll go into in a minute. But characters are trying to figure out who they are, what they want, etc. And... They're trying to kind of get to the core of, 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 of themselves. And when the characters act against their, their fundamental being, they experience suffering. Um, it often has bad results, and it, it just leads to a kind of a fundamental breakdown of their sense of self. Whereas when characters act in accordance with themselves, then it really kind of has the, the reverse effect and things tend to work out and they tend to be better. But sometimes necessity um, basically requires them to act in, in opposite of what they are. And that's difficult. Um, I, I won't be able to kind of cover the entire plot because the plot's too complicated. I can't cover all the characters. So I'm just going to focus on the core themes of the show. And if people really want me to, I'll do character profiles later on. So at its core, Babylon 5 is really about metaphysics. Just a very brief backstory. Babylon 5 takes place on the space station Babylon 5. Uh, the Babylon Project was a series of five space stations, the idea being to create a neutral zone between the different civilizations in the um, galaxy. Uh, a neutral zone where different species could meet on equal terms, where trade could happen. It's kind of a free trade zone. Uh, where culture could kind of develop and basically species could learn about each other um, while keeping people, them off each other's home worlds, etc. So the previous four stations didn't work, but Babylon 5 succeeded. And it was built by the Earth Alliance or um, humanity. There's also the Minbari, who in, in Babylon 5, there's a kind of alignment system, order and chaos. And you have uh, the Minbari, which are the oldest of the uh, young races, and they're allied very strongly with order. You have the Centauri, who are a humanoid species uh, that is very imperial and colonialist and aggressive, and they're aligned with chaos. And then you have the Narn, which are kind of a... They're a marsupial race that looks like reptiles, and they're, they're kind of um, unaligned. So that's kind of the backstory. You also have, and I'll get to the questions in a minute, I'm just giving some backstory, uh, the Vorlons and Shadows, which are kind of representatives of the, the two kind of fundamental alignments or two kind of fundamental views of reality. Now, what happened was in, in the very beginning, you had Lorien, who was the first being in the, in the galaxy to attain sentience. Um, the rest of his race also were the first race to attain sentience, but over time, they died, uh, they became sick, they killed each other in war, and the rest of them passed beyond the rim of the galaxy. Whether passing beyond the rim of the galaxy is, is a metaphor for ascending to a higher plane of existence, or they literally just have a bunch of ships sitting outside of the galaxy is not certain. I like to see it as kind of ascending into heaven, but once again, people will can debate whether things are supernatural or not in Babylon 5, or if it's just 
uh, technology appearing to be magic. But after he was uh, became sentient, the next two species that became sentient were the race that became known as the Shadows and the race that became known as the Vorlons. Now, the Shadows isn't their actual name. Uh, their actual name is in human, like, 10,000 letters long. They can pronounce it because they have completely different vocal cords. They aren't in any way a humanoid species. Um, so they just call them the Shadows for short. The Shadows are an insectoid-like species. They kind of look a bit like uh, the warrior bugs from Starship Troopers. I'm not sure if they have a hive mind or not. It would kind of make sense if they, if they, that they did have a, a hive mind. But they are the agents of, of chaos. Um, they like destruction, etc., etc. But at the same time, chaos also represents taking what you want. Um, lack of restraint, progress, conflict, evolution. Um, in fact, later in the series, there's uh, one of the good things about the show is the episodes always have good names. There's objects in motion and objects at rest, and they represent objects in motion. On the other hand, you have the Vorlons, which I guess you could say the Vorlons are perfect in essence and the shadows are perfect in substance, if you want to go with a um, a, a uh, StarCraft uh, description for the Protoss and Zerg, and actually they're fairly similar. Um, the Vorlons, in contrast to the shadows are beings of pure energy. Um, they've be evolved far beyond the need for physical form, and they exist as, like I said, beings of pure energy with immensely powerful telepathic abilities. The shadows are notable because they have no telepathic abilities, and I think how it works is telepathy disrupts their, um, their hive mind and renders them and their technology useless. Later on, when the... Um, main character Sheridan meets with uh, one of the um, the Shadow's emissaries. He describes the Vorlons as being like your parents. They want you to play nice. They want you to share your toys. They want everything to be in line with rules. Uh, the Vorlons desire a universe of chaos in which the younger races view them as gods and do what they say. Um, they're against war, they're against conflict, but they're also against evolution and change. And they take self selflessness to its logical conclusion to the point where every action must be evaluated as to whether it's altruistic or not. And kind of one of the things we, we find out throughout the series is there's a lot more going on. Um, initially, we're, we're seeing the Vorlons are basically the holy race who's come to save the galaxy, and the shadows are entirely evil. And while the shadows are certainly chaotic evil, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, the Vorlons and shadows were the two of races of the first ones who stayed behind when the rest ascended to another plane of existence. And their goal is to shepherd the younger races towards um, ascension themselves. And... To that end, they have a, a, they're at war, but they also have a truce. And the truce is they cannot attack each other directly because both species have basically limitless technology and a war between them would destroy the galaxy because they have planet killers and weapons that can blow up stars and stuff like that. So instead, there's an ongoing Cold War where they try to use the younger races uh, to fight one another, and they will fight with the younger races themselves, but they will never fight each other directly. And to this end, they've been manipulating the younger races throughout their history. Uh, the Vorlons have frequently come down to the younger races' planets and had them influence their development, mainly uh, altered their genetic code to make telepathy appear faster so that they're able to um, use the younger races as a weapon against the shadows. And what's interesting is the Vorlons wear encounter suits all the time, uh, which if you've ever seen the show, um, Koth, who's the main one, um, <clears throat> wears an encounter suit and it kind of makes, it's, it's really kind of strange looking. 
but they wear those so they don't have to be seen by other beings because in the past when they've um, appeared to various races they take the form of angels beings of light etc it's not entirely clear whether or not they just adapt to what the local mythology is like if on earth um, there were existing legends of angels and they just appear in the form of the local gods or the local gods were inspired by the Vorlon's exper um, the Vorlon's um, influence. But whenever a race uh, sees the Vorlon's outside of their encounter suit, they appear in the form of that race's conception of a divine being. So when there's this part where Kosh saves Sheridan from falling to his death, and to humans he appears as an angel, to the Narni appears as a sacred thing in that, the only race he doesn't appear as anything to is the Centauri, which have received no intervention from the Vorlons, and so they just appear as, um, they can't see them. And Kosh later states that he's resting because it's difficult to be seen by so many people at once. So the Vorlons will just appear that way. Uh, there's one part in the series where we see a Vorlon outside of his encounter suit without projecting an illusion. And he looks kind of like a giant dragon, like snake-like dragon made out of light. Uh, what the Vorlons actually look like is, is a mystery because they're basically divine beings. And so we have the Cold War between the two. And as the series goes on, the shadows more and more start trying to bring that galaxy into chaos, etc., etc. And the Vorlons start trying to influence the younger races to form a coalition to destroy the shadows. Now, it should also be noted that, and we'll get into this the set in a second, what the shadows really do more than actively try to destroy is they grant wishes. Um, you can go to the shadows and you can ask them to grant your wish and they will grant it. Be it to rule a galaxy, um, be it to see your race resurrected. Um, pretty much all of them are kind of monkey paw type things where you get what you wish for but with a twist. The only wish that's unironically granted is Veer Kodo, who's supposed to be kind of the moral, one of the moral centers of the show, is talking to the Emissary of the Shadows. And he asks him, what do you want? Which means he's asking him for his wish. And Veer Kodo merely states, I want to live long enough to see your head on, on a pike as a, as, and, and wave at you in a demeaning way as a sign that some favors are not worth their cost. And he gets what's he, what he wants with no, um, no kind of um, price because his wish is entirely unselfish. He just wants Morden gone because Morden's destructive to the galaxy. So within kind of the background of this Cold War, kind of the ultimate purpose of, of the older races and the younger races is to try and help them to define their identity. And that's what the show is ultimately about. Characters trying to figure out who they, they are. Um, one of the main characters, Londo Malari, if I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. It's been a while since I've seen this show. Um, initially believes that what he wants is to see the Centauri regain their position as the preeminent power to restore themselves, their military, etc. But once he achieves that, it's completely hollow. And he has to sacrifice most of the people he actually cared about. Um, he has to, yeah, basically just kind of um, lose everything that made him himself, and by the end he's completely miserable. Uh, Jakar wanted revenge, and by the time he gets revenge on the Centauri, it's it's kind of turns to ash in his mouth. And so generally speaking, characters are their happiest when they're acting in accordance with themselves. And when they betray themselves, it normally leads to disastrous results. However, sometimes they're forced to. And kind of the the inability to square the circle, kind of like what happened to Javert in, um, in what you call it, in um, Les Miserables, is, and, and he's unable to resolve the equation that there's something beyond law, which he's devoted his entire life to enforcing leads him to kill himself because he can't accept the fundamental 
destruction of his personal identity. So now that we're 15 minutes in, let's get to the kind of the core of the series, which is the five fundamental questions, which I think is one of the greatest pieces of, I guess, kind of philosophy in, in fiction. Um, this is actually, I think, a very important philosophical exercise, maybe one of the simplest and best ones I've ever seen, which throughout the series, the various um, elder races and the younger races ask a series of five questions. Now, I prefer to say four questions because the fifth question is a variation of the third question. But I think if you can answer these questions honestly, then they give you a very good summary of who you are, what the essence of your person is, what your soul is, and they provide guidance in life. And that's really what the elder ones are trying to, to uh, achieve to get the younger races to know themselves, both as individuals and as a species. So I'm going to go through these with examples from the show. So the first question, which is kind of the most fundamental question in all of philosophy, is who are you? And this is the question the Vorlons ask. This is the question of order, because what the Vorlons are most concerned with is how the individual relates to the rest of society. Um, they view the self as being defined by their relationship to others and their position within the social order. So let me just read this. The question asked by the Vorlons and their agents. This question covers matters of personal identity. What do you see yourself as as compared to how you define yourself in terms of others and indeed how much you accept others' definitions of who and what you are? <coughs> So this receives an entire episode about it, which is probably my favorite episode called Comes the Inquisitor, in which the Vorlons send a human from the 19th century, later identified to be Jack the Ripper, interestingly enough, to um, question Delin, who's kind of a messianic figure, along with Sheridan in the show, who views her destiny as forming the army of light and defeating the shadows once more. So he comes and he is testing to make sure she actually is the chosen one. So she has to put these gauntlets on that shock her and will kill her if she fails the test. And he continues to ask her question after question after question to try to get, um, make sure that she is, that she understands herself. So the question is, generally speaking, who are you? So first he says, she says, I am Delin. And he goes, that is not you. That is a name that other people call you. And then she goes, I am a member of the Grey Council. And he goes, you're merely using the job. Um, what, what role you fulfill in society? That's not who you are. And then he just continues to ask her and she continues to give things. I am the daughter of. And then he goes, that's not you. That is how you define yourself in relation to your parents. And and I think his his point and kind of the point of the Vorlons is is there is the self the I am the kind of core soul the the um that is the locust of consciousness is the locust of um the eternal nature of a sentient being but at the same time what kind of comes after that is entirely based on your relationship to others and in relationship to the world and acknowledging that these things are, I guess, kind of constructs. That doesn't mean they're not real, but your relationship to your, your parents, how you might define yourself, or your relationship to your society is a construct. It's not fundamentally the I am at the center of you. And his point is he's trying to get her to see how much she, to make her understand that there's a difference between who she is and how society defines her. So, for instance, he, he, the focus is to determine whether or not she believes she's the Messiah. And he, he eventually asks her, do you ever have doubts that you're the Messiah? And she says, yes, all the time. And that seems to be the only answer that pleases him. And they just kind of go through the various questions. And ultimately, Sheridan shows up and he offers to take Delin's place and die instead of her and this seems to really please the inquisitor and he says you are the right people in the right place at the right time 
you've been able to um, kind of transcend the the selfishness at the heart of human of the human person and act in a manner uh, completely coherent with who you are, regardless of the consequences. So this pleases him, and he leaves, stating the Vorlons will finally let him die, as he has finally seen the people who will save the galaxy, which was the goal in his life. So the next question offered, which is kind of a... You, you have the, the core of who you are, and you have vaguely how you relate to the outside world, so now we're going to start getting into meaning. So the second question is, what do you want? Which is the question asked by the shadows, and is kind of the question of chaos. This is, the purpose of this is in part we define ourselves, well, simply by what we want. What are our goals? What is it we desire? You can tell a lot of a man's character and who he is by what it is he wants. Fame, fortune, um, virtue to help others, to serve one's country, to serve oneself, sadism, justice. There's so many things that people can want and people can pursue. And by looking at what it is people wish for, that's a core aspect of their identity. It, it provides direction. The self, the I am doesn't necessarily provide direction, but what people want and what they're willing to struggle for provides meaning in the in the universe and once again this is related to the core of the self this isn't what society tells you you want this isn't what social expectation tells you you want this is what you want in terms of um what the core of you desires and like i said throughout the series we have londo wishing to make his his country and his nation great again but the sacrifices necessary are not what he ultimately wants um veer Koto is the only one who ironically gets what he wants because all he desires is for peace and the shadows to go away uh when sheridan wishes at the end for the shadows and vorlons to leave and to let the younger races make their own decisions they both accept it um, happily understanding that the younger races finally understand who they are and what they want and that their mission to shepherd them has been completely accomplished and there's no more need for them to be around. Mr. Morden is kind of a satanic figure who the shadows have made into their agent and he travels the galaxy asking people what they want and granting it to them. The Shadows believe in a universe of chaos where order has broken down and social structure doesn't exist anymore. That humans will be free to pursue their desires. These desires don't have to be material. They don't even have to be selfish in nature. But what they want is people to be completely true to who they are and to not define themselves with regards to other beings. So that's the question of who you want. So I think these are both very important philosophical things you should ask yourself on a regular basis as a way to kind of define and know yourself. So the third question is, why are you here? Which, when Sheridan almost dies, Lorian, the first one, appears to him and asks him this question. It's, it's basically, okay, you know who you are, you know what you want, but what gives you meaning in life? your desires give you meaning what is kind of the theme of your life what is what is your purpose beyond your desires and beyond who you are and once again this is kind of similar to the previous two questions but it's also different um it's it's kind of present tense inst instead of future tense there's lots of ways to answer this i'm here for my children i'm here for my country i'm here to serve god's will etc etc and this can be very important i know for my part um there's been a lot of times in my life where i'm suicidal but i haven't committed or really seriously attempted to commit suicide because i believe your life doesn't belong to you it belongs to god and it's wrong to take your own life uh, for that reason also i'm here because of my parents and my family and i'd never subject them to that so it's asking what is what is greater than yourself that you're committed to. Um, not just what you want, 
but what restrains your wants and what directs them. So then the, the, la the second last question is, why are you going? Which is kind of a variant of why you're here, but it's kind of a combination of what you want and why you're here. So we have, where are you going? So let's just read this. If you have a purpose answering the previous question, are you doing something to edge closer to achieving the pur that purpose or not? Are you achieving your purpose or not? Is there something holding you back, someone or something trying to deflect you from achieving your purpose so that you can be used to accomplishing theirs? Uh, to whose ends are you being used? So I guess that question is largely determined with, it's kind of a culmination of all the previous ones, where it asks you, I guess, to kind of look more practically, are you acting with regards to who you are? Are you looking to achieve what you want and are both in line with what your purpose in life is. And it's kind of the final question asked at the end of the last episode where Sheridan's dying after having accomplished everything in his life. And it kind of allows him to realize that he he has fulfilled everything and all that's left for him is to ascend and to leave the universe behind. Uh, the final question is, do you have anything worth living for? Which is debatable as it's kind of a variation of the third question, why are you here? So, a very important question, all focus on you, the asker. This is the first question that asks what is important to you that is external to you and your life. It's also the first chance to ask questions above to this external influence. So this is about um, really how you relate to other things. So, um, it's, it's to, it's to um, really just kind of how you relate to other people is I think the purpose of do you have anything worth living for? But I really think it's just kind of a variant of question three, why are you here? So that's kind of the central focus and characters will answer it based on their backgrounds, based on who, who and what they are, and based on their desires. You have characters like Sheridan or Delin, which broadly speaking act in line with who they are. And then you have characters like Londo and Veer who are forced to act in opposition to who they fundamentally are. So that's kind of one of the core conflicts of the series. And I know I didn't talk too much about the plot, but while the plot is, is good and Babylon 5 is one of the few sci-fi series to really have an ongoing plot that most episodes tie into, ultimately I think that the series is about metaphysics and questions of identity. So. I'd recommend to watch it, but keep in mind it's an early 90s show. The special effects are awful, the sets are not good, and the acting is very hammy. Um, I would, If you're going to watch it, start with season 2 and end with season 4, because season 1 has nothing to do with the plot, and season 5 is after the main plot's been resolved and there was no reason for it. So that's kind of a basic overview. Um... I could talk about it all day. It is a five-season show. Reviews of really long shows are difficult to do. But I'll leave you with this. Hopefully I'll get the review of um, DS9 out soon. So everybody have a good day and I'll talk to you later.